We've been playing a little bit of music here today, as everyone has enjoyed. And now he's going to play music with JavaScript. You can clap later. There'll be lots of time for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm Matt McKeag. Uh, I'm from New Zealand, and this is my first time in Portland, and it's pretty cool. I like it better than the Bay Area, but just, just you know, I'm going to go, and sorry, if there's people from the Bay Area here, uh, you should come live here instead. Anyway, and yeah, New Zealand's not Australia. Just get that out of the way. So, I make music with computers, and I've been doing this now for about mm, 10 years or so. But something that's recently happened is I now also make software to make music with computers. And that software is called LoopDrop. And here it is. So, first of all, I'm just going to play you a quick song just to prove that it works. And then I'm going to tell you a few things about my journey making this software. So, um, I'm just going to improvise, so I'll try to only play for three minutes and try and ignore all those things on the screen. How do you make, can you make them go away? Um, you, can, you can just not follow me until after I finish talking. No. I don't know. Just put up with it, sorry. Okay. All right, here we go.
Thanks. Ah, everything you see here is chrome. Um, but actually, no joke, um, that was entirely what you were seeing, what you were hearing, everything was JavaScript. Node.js and Chromium mashed together using uh, Electron. And I really recommend you check it out. Check out Electron if you haven't before, because it, it makes like just, it finally brings all the worlds of JavaScript together in one place. And you can use all the things. You can use DOM, you can use file system. And that's the main reason why I have made LoopDrop uh, an Electron application, is so that I can be storing large audio files on your hard drive without having to put up with annoying web stuff, because I hate the web. Sorry. OK. Um, what's the time? Do I have time for like a quick record the audience and make a song? No, I think I'll leave that. That would have been really fun, but yeah. So what I was going to do is uh, record some sounds from you guys and, and make a song with it, but I'm just going to skip ahead. So how did this happen? How on earth did I make an audio application? What got me into that? Well, this is me, aged probably three or two. Um, I was very excited about musical things, but I've never actually been formally trained in music. I, everything I've learned has been just by picking up things and trying to do things with it, and if I couldn't figure it out or I couldn't make any progress in about 10 minutes, I'd just give up on that instrument. So probably the longest I spent trying to play an instrument was the drums. Uh, I did drum lessons for about six weeks until apparently I've been told I ran away and my parents couldn't find me, and so they decided that no more drum lessons for Matt. But I did have a drum kit. My family lived in a caravan, so we didn't have room for a great big, you know, proper full-size kit like that, because that would probably be the lounge and the dining room all taken up um, in, a, in a caravan. So uh, what I had instead was this little Octopad, uh, 1980s wonderful engineered technology. It had MIDI, like... Um, Ben was talking about, so that's really cool. I didn't actually use that until like, you know, probably about 20 years later, but yeah. Um, so this is what it sounded like. This is the Roland SPD. Maybe. Let's see if I can find some actual drums in here. Yeah. It's pretty shocking, but that's what I learned on. But I didn't actually get into computer music until I was at high school. And uh, I think we were probably doing some kind of media studies class. And it turns out FL Studio was installed on one of the computers. And we didn't really do anything else but just make music. That was sort of what my small class of about four people. We just, we just, we just made music all the time. And we didn't really do much else. We just like drop out of school and make music. It was kind of the, the way of it. And we got really involved in the... Uh, the online community of like bedroom producers and and I just started uploading you know like all my music to the internet and and like people didn't really care but whatever until I made a fancy little website in Photoshop fancy for you know a 14 year old maybe 16 I can't remember it's too long ago and I just took all my songs and I put them in and said this is an album here's a free download and then somehow they ended up on some music blog and I started getting all these downloads and hits and stuff on my album, and I started receiving fan mail from people on the internet. And, I mean, I probably only had about a 1,000 fans, but that's a lot. But when they're spread out all around the internet, it's not like you really can call them proper fans. But anyway, they were sending me messages saying, like, we love your music, but then, of course, it started getting to the, you should come play a show for us in our random country in the middle of nowhere. So putting aside all the logistics of that, I can't actually play a show because all my music was created in a sequencer. So I'm not playing a guitar, right? I'm not, I'm not playing a guitar and recording that. What I'm doing is I'm sitting there with a the mouse and just plucking little dots on a screen. And then I'm fiddling with parameters and I'm doing stuff. And basically, I'm more like a painter than a performer. So 
Say if you're a guitarist, you just have to, like, all you ever do is you play the guitar, that's your job. Regardless of whether you're in, in the studio recording an album, or if you're on stage performing, you're doing the same thing. Maybe you have a bit more control when you're in the studio, but I don't have that luxury. Basically, I had to do something different when I got on stage. Um, so I had a few options. I could recruit a band. I could get some people to learn how all my music goes, and we could basically treat it like a score and play it just like the album, maybe get a bit into the jam stuff. And that would have been like really sweet, and I do quite like it when bands do this. But I just felt that, well, besides obviously getting a band is really difficult, and I'm just some guy in New Zealand, and I don't want to have to like, you know, talk to people if I can avoid it, or collaborate. Um, and the other thing is that when you go from an album to trying to play it live like with a band, you have to, you, like it's a different thing. In a lot of ways, it's actually a better thing than the album, and I kind of wish that a lot of bands would just forget the stupid sequence of stuff and just play music like these guys. Um, but whatever, um, I had, you know, I'm a computer, computer musician, this is where my skill set lies, but I decided that this wasn't the way forward. So this is the option that almost every electronic musician takes these days, it's particularly the really big ones. It's weird, either that or they go the band way, which those are good, but the ones that just push play, like, I guess it's more like they're exhibiting their work than actually performing it, and that's valid, uh, but my favorite example of all time, of course, is... Welcome this gentleman to the stage. Please give it up for Darude! Anyway, so 10 minutes later, he finally makes it to the stage. Um, here he comes. And watch this. Watch it. Wait for it. He pushes play, and then sandstorm. And I'm not going to make you put up with that. All right, all right. So what I did there was like meta pressing play because I pushed play on him pushing play. <laughs> and eventually this video is probably going to be on some video service and someone's going to push play on me pushing play on him pushing play. Um, and I think it's time to stop the cycle of, of pushing play and... Yeah, cheers for that. <laughs> and play everything myself. So I want to be able to actually, rather than pushing play on my whole track, I want to push play on each individual sound exactly when I want to hear them. And maybe I might have to resort to some uh, special equipment to help me do that, like looping devices uh, and, like, you know, multiple hands, or maybe I could genetically engineer myself, I don't know. But um, this is definitely a, a common way that people do play as well, is they will have a loop pedal and they'll just play an instrument and they'll go click and then they'll play the next instrument and click and they build up a whole song that way and it's, it's a pretty cool way of playing and that's kind of where I wanted to go. So anyway, the problem with that is I actually had to learn all of my songs. So, this album that I made here, it's pretty, like, complex, right? Um, like, I mean, you've got an orchestra, you've got like random synthy sounds. Like, I mean, where do I even draw the line? Like, what does it even mean to play this stuff live myself? Like, you know, should I be just sort of triggering the backing track and then play a synth over top? There's so many different ways you can do it. But I really wanted to actually have at least every event being triggered by me directly. So I was trying all sorts of different software tools and hardware tools and all sorts of things, and I did finally start making some progress with a few expensive things that I bought, and how do we get all the way back here? But the problem I kept having over and over, no matter like what software I used or what weird looping systems I used, they all required you to say, I want to start recording now, and then I want to stop recording now. 
or at least the first one. So basically, what would be happening is I'd be jamming away trying to play my songs, because that's hard enough already. And then when I go hit record, I then start screwing up. So I just, like, that pressure of actually having, like, this is now when I'm playing music, and or this is, this, you know, this is going to be looping for the rest of the song, I better get it right. It would just throw me off. And I'm like, okay, there must be a better way, right? Like, so I was also a software developer, kind of. I was doing some Node stuff for work. Um, and so I thought, okay, right. So there's this wonderful thing called MIDI. And every single device that's musical-ish and electronic has it. So these controllers here, which you can't see, yep, these things here, and this, these are all MIDI. Uh, and MIDI is what Ben was talking about before. It's a protocol that was made in around 1986, 1985, for transmitting just the information about what's playing, not the actual sound itself. So it's like, play a violin in 20 seconds, that kind of thing, uh, and play this pitch, and do some like vibrato or whatever. And so it's it's just all the it's like it's like a recipe for making the sound. It's not actually the sound. Anyway, so these things support it. So what it means is that when I push buttons on here, it's actually sending out data that says data that says which button I'm pressing, and I can intercept that, and I can do crazy stuff with it. And I would love to talk to you about that today, but I've already talked about it, and I've got other things I want to talk about. So I gave another talk that was entirely all about that. It's about 45 minutes long at JSConf Asia. It's also called I Play the JavaScript, which isn't confusing. Um, I probably should have called this talk I Still Play the JavaScript, because that's kind of where it goes from this point. So after I started messing around with the MIDI stuff, so basically what I did, oh, I didn't tell you what I did, sorry. I made it so that I'd inter I intercepted the messages coming off my controllers, and I was able to do clever things with them. So time travel. Basically, like what you see in this final version of the app, well, currently the current version of the app, uh, I was able to play something. Oops. I turned it down, didn't I? So I could just like play, oops. Can you play it? Yeah? No, not that. Hang on one second. Oh, I've got everything turned down. There we go. OK. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just jamming at the moment. I'm not actually recording anything. I'm not looping anything. I'm just playing whatever I want. So that's another feature it's got is that you hold down and it keeps triggering in time with the beat, so you don't have to be like, you know, finger drumming or anything. Oops. And when I like what I hear, and I'm like, yeah, I want to keep hearing that for the rest of the song, I just push that button there, and it goes back in time, and it grabs what I just played and just makes that loop forever and ever and ever until I tell it not to. So there's never that feeling of, oh, what if I screw up? It's just, I can play. Like, jamming, as if I'm jamming with myself. Like, I'm, I'm jamming with other musicians that are actually just me from the past. And I can just add things on top. And it is really great. But anyway, so I was doing that, but I was only doing it to the MIDI data. So I was only processing the stuff coming out of these, and then I was sending it off to a real audio application, Ableton Live. And that worked pretty well. But there was just little things that I'm like, ah, oh, it'd be nice if I could do this other thing. And then, and then I heard about web audio, and I'm like, hey, I'm a developer. I can make my own audio software. That's such a great idea. Yes, just waste the rest, like the next three years of my life doing that. And yeah, OK, so, <clears throat> so I got quite a long way. And I was still, at that time, trying to play my old songs. And so I was adding new features, new like transforms and ways of you know, manipulating the stuff I'd play to try and capture the same stuff I was doing on the album. But uh, I just like, what would happen is I get so distracted, instead of playing the actual songs from my album, I would just end up playing other stuff, like new stuff. I'd just be jamming and having fun, and it was so great. And then I'm like, wait, why didn't I just do that? Who cares about the album stuff? Like, that was six years ago. My fans have probably moved on to Skrillex or something. And So anyway, I discovered that it's actually a far more fun way to play music. So I pretty much just threw all my old stuff out and said, OK, well, I've created a tool that lets me play in a way that I didn't mean to, but OK, let's go with that. 
And yeah, so I was finally able to make what I do on stage and what I do in the studio the same thing, because we're not making a song, so I'm dropping sounds onto various parts of my controllers here. This is what my app lets me do. Um, so there's a combination of, of synthesized sounds, uh, samples, all kinds of weird uh, like effect type chunks. So I can play something over here. Whoa, that was crazy. Um, yeah, like that's what's really great about this is it means that I can just like improvise and crazy shit happens and I have no idea where it came from and it's, it's wonderful. And if I like it, I can hear it again by pushing the loop button. Oh yeah, and so I've made a new band, a new project called Destroy With Science. It seemed a lot more appropriate than Luna, which sounded a bit more kind of off in space. And anyway, so I've made an album, which was entirely just me doing what I'm doing on stage today. But I then took the final files and I copied them into real music software and I cut out all the terrible bits and you know did a bit of tweaking and all that kind of thing. But anyway, but the thing is, Good music is subjective, um, so I'm very, I'm absolutely fine with if you hate what I'm doing today, but I believe that music is consumed intuitively, like it's not something you consciously, you don't know if you, you don't know why you like things, you just know that you like a song when you hear it. You, there are ways of creating music technically to try and fit certain criteria, but I think that the only way that you can really create music that people will like is to create it using your own intuition, bypass your analytical brain, and just kind of do what feels right. And so that's what I've realized, is that this tool that I've accidentally created finally lets me play music like uh, an instrument where I can just sort of, I can zone out, like I have no idea what I'm doing, and that's why I record everything I do because I have to watch it later to find out if it's any good, but usually it's kind of interesting. Anyway, so that's my software, and I was just using it privately, trying to get gigs, not really hitting it, because there's so many cool bands in Wellington that it was kind of just drowning me out, but that's okay. Uh, Wellington, New Zealand, where I live. So I started showing people it, though, and they were like, well, that's really cool software. Uh, how do I no, give, take my money? <laughs> And um, so I'm like, all right, okay. So let's make a website for this thing. Let's make like a music business. Let's like, you know, next big, next big thing. We'll like totally have a San Francisco office in a few months. And but I decided a few things up front. It wasn't going to be a cloud application. I didn't see any point in adding all that extra responsibility of having, uh, you know, servers to maintain all that kind of stuff. So that's where the Electron things come, thing comes from. And also it meant that I didn't didn't have to worry about like large files and, and weird browser issues. And all this stuff is, is bleeding edge latest stuff. It's all web audio, and web audio is, like some of the stuff in the standard is in the browsers, and some of the stuff in the browsers isn't in the standard, and some of the stuff's in some browsers, not in others, and then it gets buggy in the next release. And it's like, yeah, it's a nightmare. But at least if I use Electron, I can guarantee a specific API will work if I test it this way, and I publish it, it's going to work for my users. So yeah, that's why I went with that. And I took time off from work, and I just started crunching the GitHub issues and making it all like great and, and trying to like figure out what users wanted and all this kind of stuff. But it was super stressful. Like, and I wasn't even being productive. It was just, I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to do code, just smash, smash, smash. And then, you know, I'm just like, oh, I can't be bothered. I watch YouTube or something like that. And, and then I'm like, okay, well, no one's really buying it. That was probably because it's open source. I'm like, oh, no, we'll get rid of the open source version, and we'll just we'll close it up, and then we'll you know, make some good sales and stuff. And, but it was just like, whatever. I don't know. I mean, I like my old job better than this stupid music stuff. And the saddest part of it all is that, so it was changing my focus from being like, what I could do you know, for myself, what music I could make, to being this thing where I'd like, oh, I need to fix this bug because this bug is something that a real musician couldn't deal with. Like, JavaScript has some issues um, when it comes to scheduling music, such as it may or may not run when you think it will. Uh, most of the time it works great. When I was just playing before, there was one glitch. I don't know if anyone heard it, but what happened was Garbage Collection probably decided that a bunch of the objects I'd created earlier were just taking up space. And it said, oh, how about, I don't know, 400 milliseconds just to clean up that, that stuff that you don't need anymore. 
and it didn't ask me if I wanted to do that. It just said, sorry, no more music for 400 milliseconds while we clean up. And it's so annoying, it's so annoying, and, and there's all sorts of ways you can get around it, but I haven't reliably dealt with it yet, and I'm, I'm still working on that. But anyway, so I spent like months trying to solve this stuff, going down these dark holes, trying to get to the bottom of it, and I just never did. And I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. I just want to play music. So I, I said, no, no, I'll go back to work, and I'll, I'll just spend the next few months just playing music. So every day, I'll, you know, spend a few hours just playing, jamming away. But then, like, the craziest thing happened. I started getting productive again. I just started writing, like, I'm, like, playing away, and then there's this little, little issue. I'm like, oh, it'd be nice if I could do this. And then I write some more code, and then I come back and play some more stuff, and there'd be, like, some weird bug, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll fix that, because, you know, that's easy. And just, like, little things as they came up, I started fixing them. And I suddenly became, like, way more productive than I'd ever been. Um, well, I was kind of back to the original days, of course, because that's what I was doing without realizing. And so, yeah, like, it was just so great just taking that step back and just, like, focusing on using the thing again. And at that point, I sort of realized, okay, so selling the thing is really not fun. It's not motivating me in the right kind of way. And so I decided I'd change my business model entirely. I went back to fully open source, um, and now I'm trying to figure out if Patreon is a good idea. I don't know, but we'll see. I've only just set it up. Um, so here's where you can vote on whether I should use Patreon. If you think I should use Patreon, you should give me a dollar. <laughs> I don't know. I'll tally it up at the end and decide if it's worth it. So, things I have learned from this uh, hobby project slash startup slash fun thing that I do again. You absolutely, if you're going to be doing projects in your spare time or projects that you're passionate about, you need to avoid responsibility. You need to make sure that you're still doing it for yourself. And I think open source can work for projects like this, but only if you are using all those things yourself. As soon as you like, start building up old stuff that you're not using anymore, and then people start you know, adding issues and all this kind of stuff, um, you just need to tell them, like, nah, you take it if you want, but uh, I'm just, it's not really, and just it helps with the stress levels a lot and makes, keeps it fun. And yeah, I actually realized that I find writing code very stressful when I'm focusing on writing code, when I'm like, okay, I have to fill out this, you know, these horrible things, get, get all these issues done. That just doesn't motivate me, and I find that if you can just avoid writing code and only write code when you absolutely have to, so don't write any tests or anything like that, because that's a waste of time. Just, just like, yeah, get that little bit of code you need to, yeah. Um, this is all, you know, in the context of hobby projects, right, you know? <laughs> Um, and yeah, watch out for those rabbit holes of sadness. Identify them early and get out while you can, uh, because hours, days can go by where you haven't eaten, you haven't slept, and you're just miserable and you don't even realize you are, until you stop for a second and you're just like, oh gosh, I feel terrible. Um, so you need to figure out, like, basically, when, basically when you feel like you can't stop, you have to stop at that point and come back to the next day. Yeah, this is a thing. Um, another thing to avoid the rabbit holes of sadness is like, don't use all these crazy like mega frameworks that do all this stuff for you. If you're on a big team, it's great to have that kind of consistency. But when you're working on your own, it's better if you can understand every single piece of code that's in your, your thing. You don't have to have written it, but you need to understand what it does. And this one is great, keeping your code modular, because it means that you don't actually have to write very good code. You just have to keep it all separated out so that badness doesn't infect other pieces of code. And you can just, you get it working, and you keep it in a little box, and then when it breaks later, you fix that one little part, but you don't, it doesn't affect anything else. You know, it's just contained. And yeah, like, avoid modules most of the time. Like, just copy and paste stuff around. Like, that works pretty good, too. But, you know, modules are good when, when you start finding yourself spending more time keeping the little bits of copied and pasted code up to date than actually, you know, doing other things. So that's when a module makes sense. But I mean, you know, don't, don't just like roll straight into I'm going to publish everything. Um, that's what I found anyway. I mean, if, if you enjoy doing that, do it, but yeah. Basically, this is your own fun project. You should totally be doing it like in a way that just feels right. If it doesn't feel right, stop doing it and do something else. And unfortunately, that means there's no documentation whatsoever. <laughs> so that's pretty much all the fun uh, the stuff. I'm just going to do a quick plug for my music band thing that I do, Destroy With Science. Um, I've got some SoundCloud there, and I've released an album. So uh, it's like what I was playing today, basically. Just that, but on an album. 
And uh, it's all open source, all on GitHub. If this is something that you're interested in, give it a star, at least. Um, but if it's like something you're really passionate about, then yeah, come and join me. Um, I've got, I have actually written quite a few modules of little pieces, like the sound engine and the looping engine and everything are all separate. So you might actually be able to use some of that stuff in your own, your own project. But of course, I won't fix it for you. This is a thing I wrote for CampJS in Sydney, uh, sorry, Melbourne last year. Um, it's a node school workshopper for learning the web audio API. So if you're interested in like getting in there and doing the nodes and making cool sounds and trying to get past the just the sine waves and you know get it a little bit more interesting, yeah, check that out. It's um, it's all interactive and it works online, so you don't actually have to install the the module. And that's it. Thank you very much.